story, I didn't see either. I'm Katie McDermott, and you're watching Math with Matthew. It's Math with Matthew. So go pick up your shoes. Increase your worldview. It's Math with Matthew. X equals three. Thank you, thank you. Season four of Math with Matthew. I can't believe we're already on season four. Well, every year with Math with Matthew, we try to do something new and exciting. This summer, we created a new website, mathwithmatthew.com, that has all of the TV shows, music videos, and now has something new that I've been doing, which is podcast episodes working with teachers, administrators, coaches, and professors. I have discussions on critical issues related to mathematics education. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please take a look at mathwithmatthew.com as all the great things we're doing within math education within Chelmsford Public Schools. Now, on this first episode of season four, we begin with a guest of Mr. Matt Hansen, chairman of the Board of Selectmen. They'll be watching your programming. They may still be watching TV shows. Our second segment, we explore the Honors Placement Program at the middle school with Ms. Donna Foley and Mr. Adam Felzani. Look at our students and see the scores of 260 plus. And our final guest, we introduce Mrs. Jen Dusso, new high school teacher at Chelmsford High School and they're seniors and they're ready to take on that challenge, I can bring them, you know, really far during the course of the year. Excuse me, Matthew. Excuse me. Dean Lyons, what are you doing here? Uh, it's really important. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Why am I always interrupted when I'm trying to do my open? Matthew, this is very serious. All right, what's going Our on? Math and science teachers, they're in a major dispute downstairs. Uh-oh. We need to go down there and check this out. All right, let's go take a look. Yeah, let's go. Take it to another dimension. You say math is better, you all better can it. After all, physics governs all the planets. It's math that started the game. The language of the universe, remember the name. Babylonians, Egyptians, Indians, and Greeks came up with the system for all science geeks. Evolution, distribution, pick your side. And PC. Without mathematics, none of these could be. Every tweet, every snap, and every single vine. Mathematics is the language upon which you rely. Mathematics! What you talking about? That's computer science without a doubt. You might be the language, but you need us to speak it. Think about that before you tweet it. You can't pick math, you can't pick science. Why don't we just form an alliance? If we could all just get along, together we'll be strong. Together we'll be strong. Together we'll be strong. Together we'll be 
strong Together we'll be strong I hope you enjoyed the fourth music video within the Math with Matthew portfolio. Thank you so much to Dan Williams, Zach McIntyre, Kate Burgess, Jason Dusso, Andy Fall, Tom Peterson, and Lucas Muratore for their work writing, producing, and filming Science and Math War. We're now going to turn our attention to our first guest for today, and I am honored to have the chairman for the Chelmsford Board of Selectmen here today, Matt Hansen. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show. Matthew, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's exciting. I'm glad to be here. Um, we've talked about this for a while, so I finally made it on. This is great. Excellent. So tell me a little bit about your roles um, as the chairman for the Board of Selectmen. Sure. So as chairman, I still only get one vote, but what, are the, what the Board of Selectmen does is we provide uh, policy guidance to the town, we vote on liquor licenses, we have a role to play in the budget and tri-board meetings with the school committee and the finance committee. So we do a lot as chairman specifically. Um, that's just trying to help find some compromise with the other four board members and keep our meetings uh, running smoothly and um, yeah, just trying to uh, move the ship forward. It's great. And the uh, Board of Selectmen also have a relationship with the schools and the school department and the school committee, is that correct? Uh, yes, essentially. I mean, they're, they're very um, autonomous in some ways, uh, but we do get together a handful of times a year. We do have a liaison. They have a liaison to our board. Um, at the end of the day, the Board of Selectmen does uh, recommend, make a recommendation on the budget at town meeting. Ultimately, town meeting gets to make the final decision on how much money to give to each department, including the school department. But the school department likes to get buy-in from the Board of Selectmen. If they have a new idea or initiative, if there's a reason they need an increase, they like to talk to us about that and explain it so they can have our support going into town meeting. So that's where that relationship, um, you know, that's the probably the biggest way we have a relationship with them is, is um, budgetarily. Uh, other than that, they are also an elected board, so we, you know, try very much not to micromanage their decisions and things like that. If people come to us with an issue that affects the schools, you know, nine out of ten times we're going to um, push that person towards the school committee and have those school committee members answer their questions directly. But uh, we do try and work together, um, you know, in a very positive and harmonious way. So. so it's a nice collaboration that you have with the school committee. They're an elected board as well as you as the board of selectmen. You just try to work together to do what's best for the town of Chelmsford, for yeah. the residents, and, and for the kids who are in the schools. You know, absolutely. If you look at our budget, at least uh, the past six years since I've been on the board, and I think a few years before that since um, Paul Cohen has been our town manager, you'll see that the, uh, the increases to the school department have been pretty substantial, um, usually over 3% a year. We are well over our minimum state funding requirement for the schools. So the town of Chelmsford has made a commitment to fund our public schools at a good level and provide the best education that we can. You've seen it probably just recently um, in Newsweek, Chelmsford was uh, named one of the 500 best school districts in the country. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with our, our focus on education, whether it's sports, music, um, all, the different, um, all the different aspects of our school system. We have a great school system here, what brings a lot of people into Chelmsford. So as a selectman, even though I don't sit on the school committee, I still uh, I feel that it's very important to support our school system because that's really good for our town overall. Excellent. So what's your personal motivation for why you're on the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. um, and chairing the Board of Selectmen uh, for this term? <laughs> Just chairing? I don't know. But <laughs> on the Board of Selectmen, um, it, it's very simple. It's to help make the town a better place. It's why I do what I do. You know, it's a volunteer position. We don't get paid to do it. Uh, I started out right out of high school. I ran to become a town meeting representative. I was uh, interested in government. I went to UMass Lowell to study political science. I started out as a town meeting rep, I got involved in a few committees, and I basically just wanted to get more involved. I really wanted to give sort of the residents and the community sort of a voice uh, in our government. I really see that as my role, being an elected official as a representative. So I'm not there just to do what I want to do, I'm trying to just focus on the good of the community, and I have a very long-term perspective on things. So school systems, it's one of those things where um, you know, you're really, really in it for the long term. The kids are going to be in the school for years. and, and investing in our school system. It's like investing in public safety and other things. You don't necessarily see the return the next day when you invest in it, like if you're building a building or building a bridge or something, but those are long-term investments in the benefit of our town and our youth who are going to come back and get good jobs someday and be able to afford to live in town. That's really my, my perspective on things and I just, 
um, I just wanted to get more involved and I've been doing it um, geez, since right out of high school basically. Well I think you're yeah. doing a great job with that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Last year if you remember I came to the Board of Selectmen meeting to speak on behalf of Chelmsford Telemedia. You did. And during that meeting you had some nice things to say about my TV show. I did. Let's take a look at that clip to see what transpired when I came to the Board of Selectmen. Before we leave, I just want to say your, your show is incredible. If you haven't seen it, it's like you, you can't turn it off. You're like, I want to change the channel, but I can't. It's, just, it's intriguing. It's really, it's really great. It's well, fantastic. I appreciate that. We, we could have a spot for you on the show if you're interested based on those kind words. So. I'd love to what level, make Pat? a guess that's, that's seventh grade math, right? <laughs> oh. what like, what? We do K to 12 there, so we have, we have room for everybody. I'll, you know, I'll start on one of the K shows and we'll work, we'll work me up. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. You could, you could you. call it um, Matt, um, Math with Matt Squared. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Very nice. I like that. I'm going to take some notes down on this and some new ideas. This is pretty good. Thank you. Welcome back. So in that clip, we heard Selectman Askenberg make a joke about your math knowledge, uh, Mr. Hansen, being at a seventh grade level. I think it's time that we find out how much you learn during your time within the Chelmsford Public Schools. Let's see, put me to the test. All right, so we have created some questions here okay. that start at third grade, work ourselves up through high school to okay. see how much you know based on the Massachusetts State Standards for Mathematics. Okay. So we have five questions prepared for you. Okay. Like we did on our Ion Park show, we will offer you the opportunity for a 50-50. If there's a question you're not sure about, we'll eliminate two of the questions for you, and okay. we'll see how far you can go. Let's see, I'm ready. All right, our first question comes from grade three. Which of the following fractions is equivalent to three-eighths? Would it be three-fifths, five-eighths, six-sixteenths, or negative three-eighths? Which would be equivalent? Well, I, I hate to say that this is a little bit of an easy one, but I see that it is a grade three question, so I'm just gonna go ahead and answer it. I'm going out on a limb here. I'm going to say six sixteenths. Six sixteenths. Is that your final answer, Chairman Hanson? I think so. Let's take a look. And it is correct. All Very right. nice. All right. All right. So we complete the elementary level, and we move to the early middle school level as we go to grade five. Okay. So our grade five question asks, volume is measured in which of these units? Would it be A, feet, B, square feet, C, cubic feet or D, Bigfoot. So how would oh, we measure volume? Big dog. <laughs> a big oh, dog. Big dog. Okay. <laughs> big dog. <laughs> well, um, a big dog. That's that's probably not the best answer. I'm going to disqualify that one right away. All right. So we don't need the 50/50 for no, this one. No, no, because I'm already down to three. Okay. Feet, square feet, definitely still more under the length side. Cubic feet will definitely give you a volume. I'm gonna go with C one more time. C, final answer? Final answer. Let's take a look. Cubic feet is correct. You're right, All distance right. is feet. Area is square feet. Cubic feet is volume. Big dog, not appropriate. Nice All to right. identify that. Okay, so we stick with our middle school and we move to grade seven. Oh. And this is the level where Selectman Askenberg thought you were at. So let's see if we can get this one Pressure's and move on. to the high school level. Grade seven. Negative seven plus negative two okay. equals what? A, negative nine, <laughs> B, negative five, C, positive five, D, positive nine. All right, she must not have known that math was one of my better subjects in school actually. I'm gonna actually have to go with negative nine. Negative you're nine? adding a negative to another negative, you're going further into the negative. Wow, you are making the math department look good. A, your, no. a, your final answer? It is. All right, negative nine is correct. All right. Very nice, very impressive. If you ever need a sub, you give me a call. Well, I gotta I'll tell you, there. we have a new sub uh, thing that we're doing within the Chumford School, so if That's you're looking right. for That's it, we right. would love to have you, especially right. <laughs> with this good math knowledge that you have. <laughs> well, through seventh grade. All right, through, through seventh, seventh grade. grade. All right, now we go to high school. Okay, so we go to grade nine. A right triangle with the side lengths of three inches and four inches mm -hmm. would have a hypotenuse of what distance? Mm -hmm. A, four inches, B, five inches, six, C, uh, C, six inches, or D, seven inches? What would be the hypotenuse if it were a right triangle? Okay, a right triangle with a three and a four, I can tell right away that the third side is going to be a five. Five? Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. That is correct. B, right. five inches is correct. Three, four, five is a right triangle. 
we want to ask you to factor for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you which would be a factor for the expression x squared minus 2x minus 24. Would it be x minus 3, x plus 5, x plus 4, or x plus 6? Which of those would be a factor for the expression? Well, this is still a little bit of a tough one. Maybe we should eliminate two. You want to eliminate two yeah. of the choices? Okay. okay, we are going to eliminate b and d. So the two choices we are left with is x minus 3 and x plus 4. Which of those is a factor for the expression x squared minus 2x minus 24? So it's either A or C, and it uh, looks like factors would be uh, x minus 6 for the 24 and an x plus 4. So x plus 4 is the only answer left between A and C. I'm going to, going to go with C as my final answer. Final answer, yes. and that is correct. The factors All of right. x squared minus 2x minus 24 is x minus 6 and x plus 4. Okay. So C is the correct answer. Well, I am go. very impressed with that. Chelmsford High School education. Chelmsford and, Public Schools. And there UMass Lowell. Chelmsford and Public UMass Schools Lowell. and UMass Lowell, where I spent uh, nine <laughs> good years of my, in my life. Very so, good. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the yes. show, playing the game with us. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Really nice. Anytime. I appreciate it. <laughs> We're going to be right back to learn about the honors math program within the middle schools after this Chelmsford Telemedia news break that explores the reasons why the Chelmsford Public Schools are rated as one of the best in the greater Boston area that Chairman Hansen alluded to a few minutes ago. From academics to extracurriculars, the measurements of a school's success go well beyond test scores. And as we transition into a new school year, Chelmsford students and their parents can rest assured that they're getting top-notch education. Newsweek magazine recently put Chelmsford schools in the top 500 nationwide. Boston Magazine names Chelmsford as a top 50 school district. Dr. Matthew Bayronavon says the high rankings are due to more than just academics. So we do focus a lot on our academics, but academics is not the only thing that drives us. So having that model of really focusing on the students first, everybody within the district, having high academic success, and also focusing on the whole child is three reasons why I think the Chelmsford Public Schools are really special. McCarthy School student Amelia Hughes says she appreciates the pacing of learning new material. Well, I like going to Chelmsford schools because they have a really good uh, music program and I think the learning pace is nice, like a week per subject, so we're not going too fast and we're not going too slow and everybody learns. And Christy Whittlesey is very proud of the accomplishments of the music department. I'm always excited about what's happening in our art, music, and theater programs in the Chelmsford Public Schools, and I'm pleased to report that we have been designated a best community for music education in the United States by the NAM Foundation for the past three years. And Chelmsford High School in 2015 was designated a Grammy Signature Schools semifinalist. Welcome back. Our second segment today is going to focus on the middle school honors program and in particular the placement process for the different levels within our uh, honors program. Joining us today is the middle school math coach, Ms. Donna Foley, and sixth grade math and science teacher from McCarthy Middle School, Mr. Adam Felzani. Thank you both so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. And for both of you, it's your second stint on Math with Matthew. That's correct. So That is correct. No big deal for you guys being on the show. Glad, so to, be, glad to be back, yes. Yep. All right. So let's begin by talking about uh, the honors placement process. What we do within the sixth grade year is we look at a variety of data points to determine what level they'd be most successful in. We have the honors level that begins in the seventh grade, we have the accelerated level, and then we have what's the seventh grade math level. And similar in eighth grade, we have the honors, which is the algebra one, and then we have the accelerated, and then we have the eighth grade math. So let's go through so we can inform the parents and the community about the process in which we used to go through this. So there are a variety of factors of what we look at to make sure students that are placed in the appropriate level to be successful when we start the different levels mm -hmm. in seventh grade. And let's take a look at those levels together. And let's talk about those different um, placement options. 
So the first thing that we look at is their MCAS scores from fourth and fifth grade. Donna, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of, of using MCAS? Sure. Um, MCAS is a standard that's used throughout the state, and so therefore we like to look at our students and see the scores of 260 plus are students that scored in the advanced range at MCAS. And so we want to get some stabilization of looking at the students. So we look at their fourth and fifth, people would say, why don't you look at their sixth? And the reason for that is that we don't get the sixth grade scores until the following year. So we have a spreadsheet that will have each of the students on it, and all of these data points will be on that spreadsheet. All right, and the next thing is the Continental Math League test that we give. Adam, can you describe a little about what the actual test in uh, is about and how often we give it? Sure, so Continental Math League is, uh, it's about word problems. It's wa watching students try to think abstractly through a problem. They're given six problems in 30 minutes. So time is not an issue. It's, there's plenty of time to work through it. There's no time pressure. Uh, and they can get up to six points each time. And we're just trying to accumulate as we go. So 18 over the course of these five tests is the requirement. Uh, they're fun and they're they're kind of different and so it's a chance to kind of break from doing the normal problems that come through the curriculum. Yeah, and these continental math league problems are just really open-ended problem solving where it's not tied directly to what we're doing this yep. week with fractions. It's really can you get a difficult problem and come up with a strategy of how to solve it and those type of students who are successful use, uh, with these types of problems are also very successful in the honors program. Wouldn't you agree, Donna? Oh, absolutely. And the fun thing about those are uh, one of the great things about those contests is they are non-routine problems. They're not something that somebody's been taught and re regurgitating. It's something that they have different ways to solve. And it's a great thing to do with a class after the problems, after we've taken the contest, to ask the students how they solve the problem. Because frequently students have solved those problems in very, very different ways. And it's very interesting to see how they attack them. Yeah. It shows us real resilience too, like you usually don't get them right away and so you have to attack, attack it from a different angle, try, it, try to solve the problem backwards. It's, it's, it's nice to see how students attack problems that are sort of outside the norm. And how does this test, the Continental Math League, differ from the New England Math League test? Okay. So New, <laughs> New England Math League is completely different. It's, it's almost in some ways the flip where time is of the essence. They have somewhere between 35 to 40 problems in 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. And the problems progressively get harder throughout. So, so speed is a factor. And uh, they, they do as many as they can in that time. They can get more of an instant feedback to see how, how, how well they did. And again, we're not looking for them to be perfect. Uh, you know, you don't ne necessarily see scores in the 30 very often. We're looking for a, a threshold of about 20 as part of uh, one of those placements that we use. The other thing, too, is these are multiple choice questions. So um, sometimes students can work backwards from the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, very similar to an SAT or at least parts of the SAT where um, continental math, there are very few multiple choice questions. Right. Mm -hmm. So then we have the term grades. We want to see someone who's a solid A student for their first three terms having at least a 95% or higher. Um, and then we have the honors test as something that we look at. What's on this honors test? It's not something that we ask the students to study for like we don't with the Continental Math League or New England Math League, but it's a test that we kind of created in-house based on our knowledge of what it takes to be successful in the honors program. What are we looking for on this honors test? So it was built off of the idea of an aptitude test, where again, it's multiple choice, but not quite in the same way of New England Math League. Um, the problems, again, there's meant to be a progression. They get harder as they go through each section, and then we stop, and then there's another timed section. So we kind of break it in chunks, and we're, we're looking for students to be as efficient with their time, as well as to be as accurate with their math at the same time. And in this test, too, there are um, five different sections, and students cannot go back to the first section. Each section is timed, and those are timed to approximately 10-minute sections. So they have 10 minutes to solve 12 problems. They do increase in difficulty as, um, the, as the questions within a section go on. But then when you get to the right. section two, se or session B, 
then each of those questions, again, starts out easy and gets more difficult. Can I just add on one thing too? The, the biggest thing from my perspective on the different levels of math starting in seventh grade is that there's a pace issue. I mean, some of the classes move very fast. The curriculum is very rigorous. And as part of our process, we, we want to try to get a feel for who, which students are ready for that um, accelerated pace. So some of these tests do exactly that. They kind of help us sort through who's ready to move quickly and, who, uh, and who's not ready for that, for that challenge. And the last assessment that we give is the basic skills test. What's the need for the basic skills test, Donna? Well, I think, first of all, when students are going into a very rigorous course, they're not going to be covering basic skills again. The basic skills uh, students need to have a real solid foundation in their basic skills. Okay, and the basic skills at the end of sixth grade include whole numbers, fractions, decimals, percents, um, truly some easier questions that might be on ratio and proportion because as you get to solve them algebraically later on those aren't included in the basic skills but when you're working in an honors level um, they're covering a section sometimes two sections every single day there's really not a lot of time to go back and to explain to somebody how to multiply fractions again so it gives us another foothold and the more data points that we have on students the easier, not easier, because it's a very difficult task these teachers have to go through, but it gives us the more data points that we have, the better predictions we can make on success. And uh, we have spreadsheets on every single child with all of these data points on that. Um, the parents also have this information themselves because they receive the students' MCAS scores and their grades in continental math they take home after they've taken it, New England math. The only one that they might not have at the end would be their aptitude test because that's given at the end of the year right before. If I can just add on to the, the, the point of these benchmarks is not to make a box to say every kid fits into this, every student fits into this. It's more about trying to create some, um, s some, some amount of ability to, to kind of um, see those levels, but then after that, we, we, we then do the extra work of looking at each student individually as well. So it's not like we just say, these are your scores, checked off, done. We then create another, another layer on top of that where we look at everybody individually and say, What's the, what's the best pace for that student? What's, what's the correct amount? You're mm -hmm. absolutely correct. What right. we have found is that we like to see out of these 10 criteria, generally our data says that you need to be successful based on these of at least seven of them. Mm -hmm. But it's not just cut and dry. We look at it with the coach, with myself, with the teacher. Where would they be the most successful? What pace would they be the most successful? And we look at it really on a student by student basis. And that's really what our job is. Where can we place you so you'll be the most successful in seventh grade and going forward? And we track the data not just in the sixth grade year, we look at it year to year to see how successful we are in the recommendations that we made. And based on this criteria we've created, we have been very successful. And basically, I have just built upon the work that Donna did when she was the math coordinator prior to me. And we found it to be a very successful format for putting students in the level where they can be more, most successful. Mm -hmm. uh, we want all students challenged, but we don't want them frustrated. Um, you know, students in mathematics, you know, for some students, they just need more time to absorb the information. They need more time to process the information. And so our goal here is not to be exclusive. Our goal is to try to choose a class that's challenging for students, but also that doesn't turn them off for math because that can happen it too. It can happen early too. Early, yes. And yeah, exactly. So if someone is put into a level in the seventh grade, be it mm -hmm. honors, accelerated, or that level three, they have the option to move up. It's not as though they're put in that level and they're going to be there throughout the middle school and high school career. If someone's very successful in their seventh grade year in accelerated, how can they okay. move to honors? Um, the, actually, the honors, uh, right now, we've done some nice changes. And one nice thing with the honors program is that the students that are in honors accelerated or level three are all in the same textbook. With the exception of the accelerated textbook has an additional five chapters that are actually eighth grade standards. So the first 10 um, sections of the book are the same for both. And then there are an additional five sections that you cover in honors. 
for the students that are doing very, very well and accelerated and partway through the year, the teacher um, will recognize that and they might do some work with them for the um, last part of the year to do those extra five chapters uh, with them. For some students, they've done some of those chapters over the summer. And that way, when they've completed those and they've taken the tests or the assessments on those chapters to make sure they truly do understand that information, then we've moved them into the honors program in eighth grade. Yeah, we have a couple of kids every year who might move to honors mm -hmm. from seventh grade to eighth grade. It's more likely that we have students moving into the honors program from eighth grade to ninth grade. That's it's, correct. it's an easier transition that doesn't require that summer work that we talked about. Um, but basically, if you do well and you want to move up, we offer an opportunity for you to be able to move up to a higher level um, because we do want kids challenged, but we want them at a level where they can be successful. Absolutely. You know, we have um, at the end of the eighth grade, um, again, in the springtime, usually, uh, well, the end of winter or whatever, uh, March, April, depending upon when they have to have the high school placements done, we have another uh, placement test for students that might want at this point in time to try to go into an honors math class. Uh, and again, we run a separate class for those students now at the high school, an honors uh, algebra class that they would take at the high school and then they integrate sophomore year with other students. So at that point in time, we generally have 25 or 25 plus more students that enter the honors program. Um, the other side happens too. There are students that drop out of the honors program. Uh, some students in seventh grade do find the pace is too rigorous and they might move out of that into the accelerated. That does not prohibit them from rejoining at a later date. And the final point about this, the different levels is that no matter what level you are in, you are covering the same standards, the same Massachusetts curriculum framework standards. It's based on how much depth you go into, uh, and how much pace, how fast it is. But we're making sure that all the students, no matter what level they're in, are getting the same uh, learning of the same standards because all students have to be successful on the standardized tests of MCAS and we, we do a very good job with that within uh, the schools of, of being very successful on the, on the MCAS test. Yeah. So thank you both so much for coming in to share with everyone about the Middle School Honors Program. Donna, thank you for your great work wow. as a math coach working with the teachers. Thank you. And Adam, thank you and all the sixth grade teachers for the hard work that you do uh, getting the students ready for the Honors Program and the Accelerated Program and that process of going through and helping put them in the level where they'll be most successful. No problem. Our, our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll be right back with new Chelmsford High School teacher, Mrs. Jen Dusso. Catherine, what are you doing? I am reading. You don't look like you're reading. What are you listening to on the iPad? Math with Matthew. Math with Matthew? What is Math with Matthew? It's uh, all kinds of videos that teach me all about math. And why are you watching it when you're supposed to be reading? Well, because I want to learn more about math. Is it helping you? Yes. <sighs> Welcome back, and with us is high school math teacher Jen Dusso. Welcome to the show, Jen, Thank and you. to the department. Thank you. I don't think I've actually asked you, is it Jen or Jennifer? Well, my, my actual name is Jennifer, but I prefer to go by Jen. Why Jen? Jennifer seems a little, little pretentious. Hmm. Or, or if I'm in trouble, I'm Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I could be a little pretentious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't go by Matt, you go by Matthew. I used to go by Matt okay. when I was like in high school and early college, and mm -hmm. then I kind of transitioned from that phase of my life to this phase of my life, mm -hmm. so I went from Matt to Matthew, where I could be a little more pretentious. I, I might make the Jennifer switch, maybe I just haven't found my Jennifer yet. When you come to that point in your life, you'll know when you need to make the switch. Okay. All right, so you join us from Wilmington High School. I do. Tell me, what motivates you to come to Chelmsford High School? Well, I, I taught previously years ago. I started teaching like 13 years ago. And I taught for three years and I loved it, but I, I wanted to try something else so that I knew that teaching was something I was choosing consciously and not just something I'd fallen into. Um, and when I decided after seven years in a different industry to come back to teaching, I got a job at Wilmington, which I really liked, but it didn't necessarily feel like where I wanted to be forever. Um, in the same time I went to Wilmington, my husband came to Chelmsford from Lawrence and just really fell in love with the, the district. So um, I was sort of keeping an eye on job postings and everything came together at the same time. We actually just moved to Chelmsford. 
um, a few months ago and I got this job here and our young son goes to school in Chelmsford so we are like Chelmsford 100% <laughs> now. And your husband Jason is mm -hmm. one of the uh, teachers in the science department yep. at Chelmsford High School. So how has it been the first month working uh, working at the high school? Um, I, you know, people keep asking me if 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 I'm having. I mean, it's not it's not perfect because teaching's not perfect, but the hiccups are small, and um, manageable. And it's been it's been the easiest transition to a new job that I've had so far. And this year you're teaching advanced algebra mm -hmm. and college algebra trig. Mm -hmm. How are the courses and the kids? Uh, great. I taught uh, an algebra two, which is a very similar curriculum a few years ago. So. Um, that felt really familiar to me and I was really comfortable with that. And then last year I taught an Algebra 3, algebra three class which is similar to the College Algebra and Trig. And, and I really like senior classes and I like senior classes that aren't high level. I kind of like that you know lower level senior class where it's kids who have to work a little bit harder because um, I just think that by the time they're seniors and they're ready to take on that challenge I can bring them you know, really far during the course of the year. And I've observed your class a couple of times, and in particular this college algebra trig class, and I've been very impressed with the structure of the class. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you organize and run your class? Sure. Um, so I, when I was at Wilmington, I learned about this um, distributed practice model that a teacher, um, I, I hope I get this right, I think he's from the Reading area, maybe Bedford area, um, and he came up with it. His name's Jerry Peters. And he was a, a math teacher for years and years, and he developed this model that's based on the idea that you really need to kind of sleep on it. So when you learn new material, it's not instantly committed to long-term memory. You need to see it again over a three-day cycle and practice it. And it felt right to me as a teacher, so I've sort of adopted that model with my classes now. So what are these three days? Walk us through what, what actually occurs. Sure. So, you know, today's Monday, so maybe I introduce a new lesson to my students today, but that's only a part of the class period that I have with them. Before I do that, I review some concepts we did in class, you know, last week at the end of the week. So it's two days worth of content that's reviewed, and then a new lesson is introduced. And then what I ask them to show me, their sort of exit ticket at the end of the period, that's something that we did in class two days ago. So they're not asked to show that they've mastered content until they've seen it with me in class multiple days. And the same is true with homework. I don't give them homework on anything that's brand new. It's stuff that they've seen multiple times with me um, so that I know that you know at that point I can expect them to show me that they can do it independently. And have you found that these students are able to build conceptual understanding of the concepts having it over a multi-day period? I do. I, I think that um, there's always a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to sort of like how can you ask me to do three days worth of stuff in one day. Um, but at the same time, that's really what we need them to do from year to year. That it's not learn it and forget it, it's sort of like learn it and practice it and maybe put it on the back burner, but don't forget it because math is cumulative. So they can't really learn new skills until they've mastered the old skills. And you have a nice way of motivating the students within your class. Can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about how you motivate the kids? Sure. So when I was a brand new teacher, I would have thought that this was ludicrous, but it does work. Um, I have a prize bucket. And I don't like to call on kids to come up to the board just sort of cold call. I think it's a little too stressful for a lot of kids, especially those who don't have a lot of confidence and don't have you know, a really good strong foundation in math. So I, I ask for volunteers. And because a lot of what we do during the class period is you know, skills that they've practiced and that they are more familiar with, I put a lot of review stuff where they just have to come up and write the answer and we'll sort of make sure everyone's on the same page. So um, I take volunteers and when kids come up they can write their name on the board and then at the end of the period I just roll a die or I have a dodecahedron I use for you know when it's more than six kids and uh, whoever whoever's name comes up you know that matches with the, the number uh, they get to pick something out of the prize bucket. It's very similar to like the treasure chest at the dentist's office and uh, but it is funny that that will motivate kids and I have a four-year-old at home and what motivates him is not so different from what motivates my my high school students. And you so, found that there's been increased in uh, student absolutely. participation because of it? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of days the kids will ask for a challenge question. Those are the instant pick questions. Oh, so, so if you get one of those right, you yes, immediately get to the prize pool. Absolutely. It's a, li it's a little bit of something I have to budget for each year, but it's absolutely <laughs> worth it. Excellent. Well, we're lucky to have you in the department and thank within you. the high school. Thank you so much for being on the show. And thank you to Matt Hansen, Donna Foley, Adam Falzani for also being on the show. Thanks to Tom Peterson for producing the show and to Dan Silvia for his work on the show. We'll see you again real soon.